Welcome to the Art School Podcast. I'm Ken Goshen. Since this is episode one, I thought it made sense to record a little intro to share what I'm hoping to accomplish with this project. This podcast is where I'll be talking to other artists and makers about their inspirations, their interests, and their techniques, as well as larger topics like the current state of art and culture and the role artists play as members of a wider community. I'm new at this. I've never done a podcast before, so there's sure to be a learning curve. I hope you'll look fondly at the mistakes I'm bound to make in the early episodes and know that I'll make every attempt to learn from them in order to continuously improve and refine this experience for you. My guest today is fellow paint slinger extraordinaire, amazing painter, Stephen Bauman. I'm really happy Stephen came on the podcast because beyond the fact that he's one of the best painters alive today, he's also a really nice guy and a pleasure to talk to. Stephen has been teaching in ateliers around the world for 10 years and is now working independently. So if you're looking for simple and effective learning online, his tutorials and live workshops are the bomb. And you can try them for free at stephenbaumanartwork.com. As for this podcast, it's brought to you by the generosity of my Patreon supporters. You can become a supporter too by visiting patreon.com slash Ken Goshen. That's it. And now I bring you my conversation with Stephen Bauman. Steven, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really, really appreciate it. Ken, I'm happy to be here, man. What's going on? Awesome. I would love to hear or for you to give uh, the few of us that don't know you yet, maybe a little bit about your art background, where you yeah. studied, people that influenced you. I think that would be really interesting for people to know. How, how far back do you want me to go? You, like As far, as far back as you deem important. Yeah. <laughs> That's a huge one. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, um, when you look back at your life, you know, you, you do that kind of like retrospective, like creation of a narrative that makes sense for what you're doing. Uh, if I look back, it kind of seems like I shouldn't be doing anything else because I've never done anything else. Uh, but there's probably a lot of different ways you could interpret that. Like when I was a kid, uh, I got really into writing graffiti and like, I don't know, all this youth culture, skateboarding uh, type of stuff. So I was living in Miami and kind of took after my brother because he was a bit of a, I don't know, I don't want to say delinquent, but like, right, everybody has like a teenage phase where they're a bit rebellious and maybe mine was just like longer. And so I um, eventually, rather than going to like a, a conventional college after after high school, I went to, um, I went to art school uh, in a very small town in North Florida. Hmm. Did you say something or? No, I said, yeah, I was asking which school. Ah, <laughs> you'll never have heard of it. It's okay. called the Florida School of the Arts. Um, and it was actually just a, um, it was a kind of appendix on a community college in North Florida. And when I, when I left high school, like I was, um, I didn't have like money for college and things like that. So the idea that I could pay like a few thousand dollars for like a year of art school was the only way that I could kind of manage to find my way into that, into that life. It was either that or like, I, I don't really actually know. Again, I didn't explore like the alternatives. Um, and if I'm being like flattering to myself, I'll say that it's like a Gattaca situation, right? Where I wasn't saving anything for the swim back, you know? Mm. Yeah. Hopefully it's not a reference that goes over at everybody's heads. <laughs> I'm only 40. I shouldn't, my movies that I reference shouldn't be that <laughs> like old, right? Um, I got it. So like, hopefully, hopefully people understand. But I mean, to those of us left behind at this earliest stage in the episode, all we can say is like, you can you can you can try to catch up. <laughs> Listen, by the way, if you haven't seen Gattaca, it's a great excuse to go back and watch it. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a highly uh, rewatchable movie. Um, you've got a young Ethan Hawke, you've got a young Jude Law, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so like I said, I, I didn't explore like a lot of the alternatives as, as far as like what I would do if I wasn't going to be an artist. Um, and, and, and so, as I said before, like with this kind of narrative reconstruction that we tend to do when we're looking like back at our lives, um, it just makes total sense to me, uh, right? So I, I eventually, um, I left that college and uh, I kind of just had my studio in, in South Florida for, um, for maybe a year or so. And a friend of mine was really, he was already into this like old masters business, like in, in college, you know, he was like learning sight size when like nobody was, nobody was talking about sight size, by the way, like the Florence Academy. Oh, you're, you're the sight size hipster. You knew of sight size before it was cool. No, no, I, he was, 
He, he was. was. I didn't know anything. I just saw like, um, I remember seeing a painting by, do you know this artist, Ramiro Sanchez? It's a I Venezuelan guy. No. I, I saw one of his paintings on the cover of Fine Arts Quarterly, uh, which I assume is still in print. Uh, but it's just this, uh, you know, magazine for, I don't know, like arts and culture that are maybe in our genre. And um, I was like, damn, this guy, this guy paints like what I saw in like Art History 101 when it looked like people could paint the figure, you know, and this is, this is in probably, uh, what is it, 98, something like that, 99. Um, and so I was really enchanted by that. And that, that's what sold me. He, he knew the whole program. Like, um, he, it's Steve Forster, by the way, is uh, the friend of mine who I'm, I'm referring to. He mm -hmm. runs the Long Island Academy of Fine Art. Um, and so I kind of like caught on his coattails in terms of like applying. He said like, listen, you know, all you gotta do is you send a few images and, um, and that's the application, which by the way, like, I don't know if, if everybody out there has like applied to a lot of our colleges, you know, a lot of them ask you for, you know, let's write me a story about, you know, your life as an artist and all the things that you're gonna do. And you're like, like 17, 18 years old. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I have no ambitions or like aspirations beyond, you know, like, I think I'm gonna paint stuff, you know, like that's, <laughs> that's a big ambition. So I found a lot of the, the colleges, because um, I was also like looking into other programs uh, by the time I got into college, right? Um, uh, because it was a two year school, I figured, well, I gotta do something after this. I don't know what it's gonna be. So I'll look at other schools. Um, and I found the application process at the Florence Academy was, you know, made sense to me, right? Because I, I thought that this stuff is about what it looks like eventually. Like you could write me a whole story and you get familiar with like art speak and like the way that people talk about our work and stuff. And uh, so, you know, I, you could talk a whole game about what it was gonna be, but I, I, I knew that I could talk about stuff, but I couldn't paint the stuff. So, so I figured like writing another giant essay is not gonna help me kind of turn me into the painter I wanna be. So uh, the school is just asking for like three photos and uh, your contact info. It made sense to me. So, I gather you went to the Florence Academy of Art. No, 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 I didn't. No, no oh. I was hung out in Florida. No. Okay. Yeah, I, I went. To, of course, yeah. No, I went, to, I went to the Florence Academy of Art. Me and this guy were accepted on the. Uh, we got our email for acceptance on the same day, and I'm sure that everybody is going to have some similar version of this experience. But you know, I was somebody who you know I grew up in the suburbs of Miami. Um, I was fortunate enough to to wind up in a school that that was in downtown Miami, like for high school, because it exposed me a little bit to some, you know, small microcosm of like culture and, you know, art and so on. Um, but the idea of like going and studying in Europe, that was like what the children of the Rockefellers did. Like I, I thought I had no place. How was that? How on earth was that going to happen? Right. You know, like I'm supposed to come up with all this tuition and, you know, you got to pay to get a visa to, to, to stay in Italy. I mean, it's everything costs and costs and costs. Uh, and, you know, I, I had uh, some very supportive people in my life and my, my family as well. And we kind of scrabbled it all together and I wound up being able to go. Um, and after like a single term there, which is like three month terms and it's three a year, I thought, well, okay, maybe I can do the year. Like maybe I'll wind up being able to do a year here. And, um, that was in like 2005 uh, and eventually I, I actually studied at the academy for four years um, uh, and starting to teach somewhere inside there as a student teacher and things and uh, then eventually when I graduated I was hired as an instructor my wife as well uh, I'm pointing to her like you can see she's upstairs <laughs> uh, Cornelia Hannes um, who's also like obviously an amazing uh, painter um, yeah, we got hired as teachers to to work there and we worked at the Florence branch, we worked at the Sweden branch and we worked at the US branch while it existed. And uh, then we left finally and, and, and we're living in Norway. That's where I am now. Um, and I haven't started up my fireplace yet. So I'm wearing, I'm wearing wool. So that's, that's the backstory up until this final moment where I'm having this cup of tea and chatting with you. When you were studying at the Academy, uh, did you know Iran Weber by any chance? Yeah, yeah, he came there, I think, a couple of years after I had started. I really liked his work, actually. I was trying to, um, at the time, engage in a, uh, a trade with him for, uh, for this one beautiful, like, mask that he did. It might have been a part 
of a 3D head. It might have been like a full head that he had just cast a mask of. And I really wanted it, but I couldn't afford it at the time. But yeah, I knew, I knew Iran. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think uh, I could probably attribute some of, of my personal, uh, you know, I, I guess you could call it faith in the ability to learn these things. Because when I was a kid, I was uh, a little bit, you know, caught in the myth that in order to paint well, you need to be talented. Uh, mm-hmm. But Iran really, uh, when I met him, kind of explained to me, no, man, like there is a method. And if you learn the method, you too can be one of the talented people who now people yeah. refer to me as talented. And that's a little funny because it's, it's honestly just, you know, put the building blocks together and the hours. Uh, and I really do mm-hmm. think, I think we're, we're probably on, on a similar page on this and tell me if, if I'm not, but that this thing is, is completely instructable. And, uh, and that you can teach it to somebody uh, as long as they're willing to put in the effort and put in the hours and that it's not, it's not like this magical thing that, that only a very few geniuses were able to do throughout history and is no longer accessible. Uh, what's your yeah. thought on that? Yeah, no, I mean, of course, there's uh, so much of it is like um, skill building. And I think like a lot of the technical uh, foundations of it, you, you can definitely build up. I mean nobody looks at like a doctor or a pilot and says, oh, they were so talented. They learned to fly or they learned to, uh, I don't know, diagnose uh, sicknesses. Uh, so much of it is, is technical. Um, you know, we can't swing too far to the other side of the spectrum and say that, that there isn't talent or there isn't aptitude. I, I tend to maybe refer to it as aptitude, but because I, I think it's probably just a, a sensitivity around that word of talent because um, it is something that the uninitiated will use to kind of refer to ability in the arts. And I, it's not anything malicious or, or anything by them, but it's simply like the popular cultural notion of what it takes to be an artist involves uh, talent and every movie from uh, that one about, uh, what's his name, uh, Jackson Pollock, you know, like all these, these movies about artists, it's the, the, the story is in the passion and the talent, not in the, the grift and the hard work that, that actually gets you to, to where you're supposed to be going as a representational painter. When do you think this myth kind of took hold? Because, I mean, when we, when we look at 19th century academicians, uh, it mm-hmm. was, uh, maybe I'm wrong in, in assuming so, but they really thought of themselves as kinds of establishments where if you walk in through the door and then you do all the mandatory assignments you're gonna come out you know exponentially better at painting and drawing uh so how did we come to this point where it's so conventionally understood that this is something you're born with i'm sure that somebody out there could kind of point to um a a book but you know you could go even well i just to say like usually ideas are introduced through some sort of media some sort of culture like that where um where one story has kind of taken on like a large amount of kind of meaning for a particular uh, um, uh, endeavor. But if you you kind of go even further back, I remember there's a great book called uh, From Dawn to Decadence. And I don't remember the name of the author, which is very typical of me, but uh, it's a book that it's one of these giant, like it's, you know, as thick as as an oak table, you know, one of these uh, um, books. And I, I did my best to read as much of it as I could, but eventually some of that stuff gets very heavy for me. And there was a really interesting part uh, where they go all the way back to, I think it was like the monastery associated with Notre Dame, mm. right? Yeah. Um, and actually it's a, it's a really funny moment in a very thick and heavy book uh, where the author is kind of referring to this kind of sea change that occurred, right? So at a certain point, um, musicians, and that's a lot of the, the um, in, in Notre Dame, apparently in this monastery, this is a lot of the focus was on like creating music and, and music for, uh, for worship and so on, right? Um, but at a certain point, music was not signed. Uh, these practitioners, these composers would um, put together this music and, and it was, they were like a craftsman. Like it's like a basket weaver signing his basket. Like, right. would, why would you, it's a basket. I'm going to put food in it, get out of here. And there was this, this, this change in the way it was perceived. And uh, these composers started signing their compositions. And the author, it's so funny to me. Nobody else is going to think it's funny. It's fine. <laughs> but he entitles the, this chapter in which he's talking about this, A Star is Born. 
And it's just like the driest kind of humor <laughs> referring to this kind of change in the way that artists were perceiving themselves, right? So, you know, the, the change in between art and, and, and the practice of art being understood as something that is, is a, a trade and a craft and something that you can skill build into the, uh, I'm just a wild, talented person and I came out of the womb this way, is one in a string of changes in the way that we actually perceive kind of being an artist in, in society. So where did it start? I don't know. I mean, did, was, was signing our compositions the, the first step on a pathway that eventually led to this, uh, this idea of the kind of monolithic hero artist that, um, uh, that just swashbuckles and everything they do is, is genius. I don't really know where you could say that the tipping point was, but if I if I were to speculate about the 20th century, you know, movies, documentaries, books, all of these all of these parts of media um, require a story, and stories are in some ways formulaic, right? The hero's right. journey is something that has been like uh, documented. You look at movie scripts, the in some ways like they're all the same right that, right of that course you have to go through these set of steps to kind of create something and um i think if if we're going to talk about an artist in in media in a movie and that's by the way where everybody gets to know things nowadays is through movies through books through things that we're reading so we get to know things through stories and uh, stories about all of the time that a person has to spend like making charcoal drawings that suck it's not a great part in a book or a movie you know yeah, I actually, I really like this analysis. It actually brings to mind uh, maybe the quintessential hero's journey uh, story that we know from from pop culture, which is, I think, the original Star Wars. And mm. and really there, you can see how talent is emphasized. He's born with a, an affinity to the Force. Mm. And I mean, his training consists of basically like just a... like. Ex the, the initial training that he does with Obi-Wan, I did not expect to be talking about Star Wars, but, uh, and I don't even know if you're a fan, but I'm going to assume that so somebody listening to this is. Yeah. Uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty minor scene, you know? It's, mm -hmm. uh, and then when he trains with Yoda, it's kind of like, no, you know, how much time can I really devote to this? This is something that's supposed to come from within. And I think that tension is, is expressed really beautifully in that Yoda scene. Like in the first scene, mm -hmm. and the first scene, in the first movie, it's mostly talent and then mm. when he meets Yoda then it becomes about wait a minute maybe talent is not enough you have to stand there and you know do the hard work and uh, that's where that, we do the montage we cut to a montage so it's right. really short so we don't have to see all the uh... <laughs> but uh but I'm gonna put you on the spot because there's something about talent uh that I do think is to some extent identifiable and uh, I want to bring you back to, I think it was five or six years ago, there was an exhibition at uh, Grand Central Atelier after mm. they moved to their uh, LIC location. Mm. It was uh, a graduating year show plus uh, faculty show and your work was there. Mm. Uh, and I, I remember very distinctly Maybe you don't. Your your face suggests. Well, I was just trying out. to think. Of, I've done. I've been in a few shows there. I was trying to think of which one that would have been. Oh, so we have two pieces there. One is a a, a girl holding a candle, and the other was. Uh, uh, I have yeah, no recollection. Holding, there's Go ahead. A halo around. That. Wow. Okay. Good. So <laughs> there there is such a. Well, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna figure it out. Right, what uh, was the second one? Hold on. What was the second one? The second one was a drawing where you saw several portraits on the same page. Okay. Uh, graphite drawing was that there yeah it was there it was there and it was stunning and i remember it and it's very like a central figure and she's like doing this and then mm -hmm. there's a bunch of yep, yep i don't yep. even i don't have any recollection of that showing there but it's cool that it was yeah. i love that drawing <laughs> so that it was very very good uh and i do recall my experience from from going there is that the majority of the work i found to be impressing mm. but i personally uh have an issue where i feel like Something that's really important about uh, making art these days, I think, and this might be just a matter of opinion, but I want that stuff to be identifiable. I mm. want the style to kind of shine through. And your work from across the room, I was like, that's Steven's work. I mean, I know his work and that's, it's great to see it in person. It's the only time that I saw your work in person. And I did remember that, you know, from a collection of, of a lot of, of uh, what we might deem, you know, classical inspired, realistic paintings, 
some of them manage to have that edge of looking like we know that person painted it. And some of them are just like, that's the person who went through the program, did all the steps. Uh, but maybe something is, is still mm -hmm. missing. Uh, does that speak to you? Is it something that you think about personal style? How mm -hmm. do you, how do you think about those issues? Yeah, it's a, uh... You know, it touches on something that I think is an important question, by the way. It's important only by the virtue of the fact that I think everybody asks it. It's uh, one of the, the most frequent things that you kind of come across when you have like online forums of people talking about artwork. Everybody talks about your style and finding your style and finding your voice and your vision and all these things. And I've spent a lot of time kind of considering you know, where that comes from. I mean, so I'll just do what I normally do, which is digress dramatically back to something that seems to have nothing to do with it and then take a really, really long time to explain my point. But hopefully it's kind of interesting and entertaining. So initially, right, when I started getting into this stuff, um, when I started getting into representational art, I was still like a graffiti writer. So uh, I was kind of more interested in like lettering and these things. And style is a very like quintessential part of graffiti writing. Like, if you think it's important as a painter, like it's the only thing in graffiti. Like if you don't have your own style, like you're mocked, like you're ridiculous. So it was already something I understood that, that, that looking at art that way was how I kind of interpreted things. I didn't have many other ways to interpret anything. So I would spend a lot of times back when like bookstores were a thing. I'd spend a lot of time uh, at this bookstore called Borders, which was kind of on my transit route between downtown Miami and, and home. Uh, like after school, like I'd, I'd go and skate and, and eventually I'd wind up there like looking at art books and things. And I looked at a lot of Egon Schiele and everybody knows Schiele. If, you're, if you've ever been a young and passionate artist, probably you know Schiele because that's what his work kind of speaks to, right? And it's this like very almost like teenage angsty uh, kind of passion that, that, you, that you see in his work. Um, there was a point at which if you looked at my figurative work, all you would have seen was a very bad copy of Sheila because that was my only influence. That was what I saw. And so that's what I thought it was supposed to look like when you, when you kind of made artwork. Now, I think that people, you know, I don't know if we, we change, we grow more sophisticated. We, we definitely uh, engage with new ideas and experiences and broaden our horizons. But I think the basic mechanics of, of influence and vision are not so different. If you have one influence, then you don't have a style because you have the other person's style. I think if you have a thousand influences, right, you, you gravitate towards those things that, that speak to you and all of them influence you. And at a certain point, and this is just my opinion, everybody can have a different opinion about it. At a certain point, the, the quantity and saturation of that influence renders the individual parts less noticeable. So I still love Sheila. I think it's still really interesting. And there's probably still like some small element. If you looked deep into, into my work and tried to find what it was, probably you could find out, you know, where that influence is. But it's, it's mixed together in a soup of so many different things that yeah, I mean, that's, that's eventually where my style comes from. Now, being that this is an idiosyncratic thing, I'm speaking about it from my, my own experience. I'm sure other people uh, have a vastly different take on that. And I, I wouldn't want to um, in any way indicate that this is how style works. <laughs> this is how style worked for me. And it's my understanding of it. Uh, and I also think that it does speak to one thing that I do feel is fairly universally true about it is, is it's not something that happens. It's a trajectory. It's a timeline that is, that is very long. Uh, and if you're um, struggling to search for yours, honestly, probably work and patience are going to do you more good than, um, than any like pearls of wisdom. Exactly. I can say that something I, I do find I think would be really, I recommend this to my students uh, all the time and I, I do this myself, but getting to know actually what it is that you like about artwork. And I, and I don't mean that like, you know, meditating uh, uh, in mysticism. I mean, literally like making a mood board and putting onto it the things that you're attracted to and searching for the commonalities 
and the contrast in the things that you're you're attracted to. Exactly, right? Yeah, I've this never is the heard way that yeah. you actually get to know what you like because most of us, you know, if you've ever had an idea for a painting, we've all had an idea for the painting. It's the, it's the best painting ever, right? Because it's like back here, and then you do a study of it or something, or you even worse, you try to make the giant painting without doing studies. <laughs> And you realize, oh, no, actually, it wasn't that good because I didn't really know the idea that well. It was just a notion that I had. And I think that your sense of your own style, your sense of your own art appreciation is a lot like that. It's better if it's out here and you can kind of look at it, you know? I've, I don't think I've ever heard somebody give uh, an answer to that that I, that I relate more to. You use the word soup. I usually, when I talk to my students, I use the word cocktail. I think it's like, when you're, when you're searching for your style, I think the best thing that you can strive to be is the cocktail between your, your, favorite, your favorite inspirations, right? Like, for example, you are, uh, you know, you're an admirer of Da Vinci and you're an admirer of Monet. These are things that don't connect, you know, they're disconnected through time. Mm -hmm. But if you're deeply passionate about both of those people, then in your work, you're going to see hints of Da Vinci and hints of Monet uh, mm. in a way that's very idiosyncratic to you. You know, it's very specific to you because that's what you love about Monet. That's what you love about Da Vinci. And you could be passionate about bringing those, those two different styles together into one. Mm. And I think there's something about being really honest and, and being very rigorous about the way that you put it. Uh, understanding what you like and what you don't like and what you're trying to incorporate and what you're trying to reject. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, in my opinion, the most natural, not, the most natural way to develop one, one's own style because it's mm -hmm. almost like the way that I like explaining it to people that I think is, is, is easier to get is instead of trying to find what you like, just keep on rejecting things that you don't like. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh, in this painting, I like whatever, 80% of what I did, but these, you know, remaining 20% are horrid and I will vow to make less of those moves in my next painting. And as long as you're critical about not only your work, but the work that you're exposed to in your, in your research or in your, in your reading and in, in, in whatever it is you're up to, I think it's, it's a, fair game and a necessary game to look at other people's work and say, wow, I really, really love this, that part I don't like. And, yeah. and I think that's, that's kind of important. I don't know what you think about that, but um, it's good to sit and stew in that feeling. It's like, why don't I like how he painted that tree? Like, what about that tree kind yeah. of rubs me the wrong way? And then when you, when you sort of understand uh, where that's coming from, I feel like you, you're on the fast fast like you're on the highway to not painting trees that way and when you yeah. don't paint trees that way and other people's trees do look that way uh mm -hmm. then you're you're on the path to developing your own style and and yeah. i do think that this goes hand in hand uh very harmoniously with what you've mentioned of having multiple inspirations because if it's just da vinci and and degas or, or da vinci and monet then then it looks like a strange chimera with two heads and that, that still looks like a monster. But the more you turn that stuff into white noise uh, mm -hmm. and the more you really embrace people uh, that in their work you find things that are valuable, worth preserving, mm -hmm. uh, worth incorporating, uh, it becomes too impossible to, to, to kind of tell those inspirations uh, from one more holistic mixture, which is the cocktail or the soup, depending on whether or not it's... Uh, it's uh, wholesome experience that you're suggesting or, or something a, a, little, a little different that I'm alluding your, to. Your set of inspirations is more like a party and mine's more like dinner. Well, that's, that's also part of a personal style, maybe. I, I don't know. We'll have, yeah. we'll have to see. But, uh, but I, think, I think that leads, that leads me in a, in a pretty, pretty straightforward way to, to really talk about the old masters because mm -hmm. I feel like this is something that from just now talking about how to develop a personal style uh, they came up naturally with, with the way that we were talking about. It. And I think both of us have a fascination with them. Uh, so I would, I wanted to ask you, you know, beyond this, how, why is it relevant? Like why, why are we still looking at these things? Uh, because I think it's not, it's not obvious to people. So, you know, it's shocking to me every time because I get, I get heaps of DMS. It's like, what do you recommend? What should I do? What should I do with my drawing? What should I do with my painting? And, 
these these are people that you know their work suggests very very uh cursory uh familiarity with art history and my my immediate you know advice is to anybody who dm'd me or will dm me in the future go to your nearest museum and spend some days there you know what what's your thought on that well it's it's interesting because you have a lot of different phases in your career in which going to museums can be very different experiences like I remember distinctly in um, when I when I first went to Europe, uh, I did uh, my first year uh, in Italy. I, I did a bit of traveling, right? So I went to Budapest and uh, Paris and um, and Vienna, and I had just gone through maybe my first first one or two terms at school. So my education was that of somebody who had done a couple of copy drawings and some cast drawings and. Uh, you know, some pencil and charcoal studies of the figure. That's all I kind of knew at that time was just this base level of, of kind of visual phenomenon, right? I knew what a shadow shape was. I knew uh, what a contour line was, you know, but, but that was the extent of my, my vocabulary at the time. So I went through these like incredible museums in Europe and I looked at these paintings with a student's eyes and while you can ine inevitably find like something to take away from it and something to appreciate, going back and visiting those same paintings years later, I saw so much more. So going to museums and studying work is, is a great way, obviously, to, to kind of find inspiration. And also, I mean, let's say to find information, to, to learn from things. But I think that we should also respect the fact that that there are going to be limitations to what you can see if you if you don't have the vocabulary, right? Uh, like right now, I'm I'm learning Norwegian and I'm horrible at it. God, I'm horrible, and it's really bad. Uh, and when I think of trying to express a thought, it's like um, it's like sandpaper in my mouth. I just can't. Ah, uh, this this friction. I can't get it out, right? But as a student looking at those museums, it was kind of the same thing. I, I don't think I could delve actually very deeply, deeply into things, right? So there is a kind of baseline for self-education. And I know this is, by the way, the, the big dichotomy out there is people say that you can be self-taught and you can uh, get a, a, an education in, um, in drawing and painting. I, I know that coming from an academy, obviously I have a bias uh, towards that. But yeah, I have that bias because of what it revealed to me. It, it, it revealed things that I thought that I could just see, but I did not see. Um, I spent a long time uh, developing my visual language, my understanding of other people's visual language. And the great thing about the old masters is because, or is that rather, that it's already written. Uh, and there's a lot of ideas and education and learning surrounding it. So it is possible to tap in to what they were saying and what they were thinking and their thought process and to read that in the materials they used. Uh, it's something set in stone because it's already happened. Studying artists nowadays, I think is fascinating. I think it could be very frustrating as a student because it's so fluid, right? You know, I know a lot of people like uh, younger people that, that I work with and um, they're out there on the internet, like finding their, their education in their own way. And, you know, it's an ever like shifting set of, uh, of concepts that are out there. They're, they're constantly in evolution. It's like trying to learn, uh, you know, 2020 slang. It's going to change in a minute. <laughs> as soon as you learn one set of, of uh, you know, that vernacular, it, it's going to be totally different in the next moment. And obviously visual culture is not exactly that way, but you understand my meaning part of the strength of the old masters is that they're there people have been studying them there's a lot of uh, a lot of education a lot of learning that's already surrounding that that you can use for your benefit i think so i'm totally totally on board and uh, let's let's drill down a little bit about that so you you're suggesting that and i'm sure you're right that when we go into the museum before we have a uh, kind of like a baseline understanding of, of what it is that we're looking for, it can, it can look completely opaque. Like, how am mm -hmm. I going to look at a Rembrandt and, and gain any sort of benefit for myself? So is there something that you would suggest to people who are now 
excited about getting into this world. They want to go to the museums. They want to go face to face with Rembrandt and they, they want to derive as, as much meaning from it and, and gain as much knowledge from it as, as they possibly can. What should they be asking? How should they you know, elevate their thinking about this so that um, museum experience is, is a productive one as opposed to, oh my God, I'm so frustrated, like I'm never going to be able to do it. How can we, how can we go from here to there? There's, uh, you know, not that I'll dispute the existence of those two, two points in space, but I would just add to it that, that also like, I did enjoy my trip to those museums. Um, however, in retrospect, I, I understand like the limited capacity I had to actually learn from those things. I would say that definitely drawing and studying those works that you are enamored with, I think is the first step on the way to uh, um, realizing some communication between you and that, and that artwork. Now, drawing in and of itself is, is, not, um, is not an assured pathway in between you and knowledge. Because again, uh, um, I know you've studied extensively, uh, I have as well there's a lot of different concepts you can use to draw. The closer you can get to understanding the concepts that that artist was using to draw or to, to paint um, in, in most cases, of course, uh, I think the, the more that you can receive from what they're doing, right? Like if you can um, look at a Rembrandt and understand, for instance, what is the lighting situation in the room and how is that impacting the information that he's putting onto to his canvas? For me, it's unlocking things like that, uh, asking questions, certainly being critical, but also just trying to understand the, the context uh, of what was going on there. But you need, you need like the right questions, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what, I'm, what, what we're, trying to, yeah. we're trying to figure out. Because, for example, I, mm -hmm. I would get, you know, I, I, I would see messages from people saying, here, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm studying Rembrandt too. And you see this like eye with eyelashes and, yeah. you, and you know, every little hair of the beard and or, or, or whatever it is. And, you know, to me and you, it, it makes perfect sense that, that that's the less productive way uh, mm -hmm. of looking at, at the Rembrandt. And, and for me, what I analogize that to is, you know, if you're if you're let's just say you want to study magic, painting is a kind of magic and you look at the magician, you know, what Rembrandt has created as the image, the person, mm. that's the final trick. That's the illusion. As yeah. somebody who wants to learn how to do that trick, what yeah. you want to try to understand is, wait, where is the magician pointing my attention? Because at some point, he's making that rabbit disappear. I have to understand what are, what, are the, what are the methods that he's using to point my attention here, point my attention here, to hide some things from me, to reveal some things from me. Because if you're going to paint a Rembrandt or draw a Rembrandt and you're focusing on, you know, the eyelashes and, and, and the things that have to do with the subject that is painted, then you're yeah. still captured by the magician's illusions. And I think all those questions have to be, well, how is he making me feel like there's an eye there at all? How am I feeling like, like there's, there's hair on that face that we can call a beard? Like what, is, what are the actual tools that he's applying in order to trick my eye to believing that this two-dimensional surface with some glue and, and pigment powder on it uh, mm. looks like a person that I could have a conversation with. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think part of it starts with, uh, certainly starts with vocabulary. And this is um, maybe the, the part I was trying to find a way around in, in, in talking about it, uh, is that I, I don't want to indicate that only going to study somewhere is the solution to to getting the answers that that you're looking for uh, there is self-education that can occur but i think honestly you'll, you'll have to be reading books and and you'll have to be in fact very uh rigorous in the way that you search out this information because for instance if i say to you uh a primary factor in the the expression of rembrandt's work is values right now i know that when I look through that keyhole, that is the word values, there is a vast network of connections, right? That go out into every level of painting and drawing. You know, the, the, from the value of a line to uh, value produced by various like layers of paint and different le levels of opacity. You know, values permeate the entirety of that, uh, of that world. If though you're on the other side of that keyhole and all you see is the keyhole, right? You just see the word values. It doesn't mean anything to you. 
right? Like right. I spent I spent plenty of time working and not knowing what values were, right? Uh, I had heard people talk about it. I even read some things about it. I don't know if I understood really the application of values in the translation of visual phenomenon, right? But you have to understand that. Like that's a deeper level of allowing yourself to engage with and understand like Rembrandt's work, for instance, or, or really, by the way, with values, anybody's work almost, you know, it, it exists everywhere, but you, you, can't, uh, you can't see it unless you're uh, kind of looking for it. So you go to books like uh, Harold Speed, right? Uh, now I have a series of books that, that are in my orbit that, that are meaningful to me. Uh, they're by far and away not the only books about this. There are contemporary books that talk about values. There's antique books that talk about values. Uh, but you have to read up on it. You have to look at multiple sources for it, by the way. Also, when you're getting an education... I don't want to interrupt, but I'm yeah. sure people listening are going to be asking, name the books if you could, because they're going to they're gonna want to read them. So if you, if you could give your recommendations if you're, if you're uh, deeming them to be very valuable resources. For sure, yeah. Uh, I think that uh, the first books that, that spring to mind uh, are, are both of Harold Speed's books. If you're just starting out, The Practice and Science of Drawing is a, a fantastic one. You cannot go wrong reading it. Uh, it's um, based on as much established truth as possible uh, and it's explained really well. And he actually manages to make it readable, which, by the way, if you ever read something by... <laughs> I love him. But if you've ever read Vanderpool's book, oh my gosh. I couldn't, I can't deal. I couldn't get through it because it's so, it, to me, to my uh, mind, it was just so dry. Um, but so starting with Harold Speed is fantastic. There's another book that I think would be great to have read if you're entering your first museum and trying to understand what you're seeing. Uh, but it's just called Composition by Cyril Pierce, C-Y-R-I-L, Pierce. And for me anyway, this book on composition was the one that had the least misunderstandable orientation, <laughs> you know, like composition, like if, if, if you think values are like a complicated idea that it, it's difficult to kind of grasp and understand without the practice of a composition is like, I don't know, like trying to be an astronaut on your first day. Like it's, it's, there's so much inside of it and you need like such a high kind of baseline of education or, or understanding we'll call it right to actually engage with composition because it requires values, it requires design, it requires proportion, it requires like all this stuff that if you don't have, it's like just, it's oh, like composition is kind of a mystery, right? Uh, interesting. Uh, I would, I actually think a little bit the other way around because, yeah, because, yeah. because, because for me, uh, at least, okay, so this, uh, so many threads that I want to, that I want to catch. Uh, but first, before I, before I go on a, on a ramble here, I want to I wanna throw uh, another book to the list, uh, The Art Spirit by Robert Henri, I think is, is a great one. And also uh, The Story of Art by uh, Gumbrich, I think is a, is a necessary one. So if, for all you people writing book lists, uh, I would, I would uh, recommend these two as well. Uh, and the thing about composition, at least for me, uh, is once people understand that what's in front of them is an arrangement, arrangements of shapes, of, of colors, even before you know that a color is, is, you know, comprised of a value, chroma, hue, like just people understand that, you know, I put the head over here, I put the, 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 the hand over there, and that that's not an arbitrary decision. This is something that could have gone in any way. And the way that I like explaining it to people, and, and usually I, I, do, I, do, uh, I do see it as, as beneficial, and, and hopefully the listeners would as well, is I think the best way to, to get at composition, if you have no idea what we're talking about, is think about what happens to you when you're walking in a museum, you're seeing a painting from across the room, and you're compelled to go closer before you know what's painted. You, I think all of us know that feeling. You're like looking at the distance, it's like, ah, what's, what's that? What's, what's happening there at the other side of the room? And what called you closer before you understood that it's whatever, Chardin's duck or Rembrandt portrait or a Caravaggio, you don't know what's painted. But the question is, what called you to come closer? You know, mm -hmm. before you knew what it was. And what called you was an abstract arrangement of shapes and colors on a canvas that have a relationship between them that is, is completely sensory. You know, it triggered your eye in such a way that it, it functioned like a visual magnet and called you to come closer to the painting and then engage with the narrative. But the narrative is, is secondary 
to how the canvas is organized as a two-dimensional space with, with some glue rubbed on it, you know? And that, to me, at the end of the day, is the beginning and the end of art. At the end of the day, your art ends up on the wall. Does it call people to come close or not? Like, it doesn't really, at least to me, matter how correctly you've, you've uh, articulated the clavicle if nobody's coming closer to your painting because the way that you've organized your canvas is, is not compelling. Mm -hmm. And I think to, to me, it's very, it's very helpful to use that explanation with students because then they kind of understand, oh, we're not just doing people and I shouldn't only be concerned if my leather glove of the figure looks like leather, but yeah. where, where should it be on the canvas such, such that this uh, visual, visual object uh, becomes something that people want to engage with uh, as, as opposed to just, you know, walk by. Yeah. For sure, this is, uh, and, and I think it kind of speaks to something I, I always considered to be really interesting uh, after I kind of been doing this for quite a while, is there's kind of two different um, ways that we will look at artwork. And when you're a student, I think you lose one of them for a while. You know, you kind of lose that ability to just look at an artwork right? Like to just go, oh, I'm just moved by this, by this thing. Like I was talking about, you know, going through the, the museums in Europe as a, as a student and thinking like, oh, I don't know if the drawing of that foot makes sense. <laughs> That's such a stupid thing to say about like uh, this, you know, giant altarpiece that, that obviously is incorporating so many different things. Um, but I think that a lot of the, um, a lot of the mechanics of, of expression are really important to practitioners and in fact, probably shouldn't be at all to like art appreciators. And I think that's why, uh, you know, I've gone through various periods where, you know, you're almost so consumed in the making of this thing. You, you, you just, I, I couldn't even appreciate it for a while. It was just so much, um, so much dissecting what, what was happening. But I think it's important. I think obviously if you're an art maker, you need to know what combinations are going to strike that chord because eventually communication is about control. Like I don't just, you know, like bang on my keyboard like this and hope that the poem I'm writing comes out. <laughs> I choose words. I don't write poetry, but I choose words really specifically, right? To say, that's what I want. Boom. That's the expression. That was what the sunset seemed like to me. And I think to get to that level where you're able to kind of manipulate and control those things, I think it's, uh, it's almost like a cold passion versus hot passion thing. You know, like when you hear filmmakers talk about, all right, so <laughs> this is such a weird story. I wound up having a conversation with uh, the guy, the head screenwriter for Toy Story 3, right? Uh -huh. Which and was a brilliant thought, movie, I think, in my opinion. Yeah. I didn't like oh, the yeah. fourth one, but the third one was great. By the way, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, and this is why, why this thing sticks in my mind so much. I, I cried during parts of Toy Story. It's so good. It's so They're good. going down in the, in the furnace. I mean, I was just, you know, yeah, I was it's, totally it's, it's beside myself. It's a completely myself. shocking scene. And, <laughs> and so I'm talking with this guy about screenwriting. By the way, he said the furnace scene was like the easiest one to write. It's like he said it was like nothing. <laughs> but that's the one we're all really moved by. But uh, eventually he, um, we were talking about, uh, uh, like, I was asking, like, well, what, is the, what was the, like, what was the hardest part? Like, what were the challenges that you were facing? And, and uh, I don't remember the scene that he was describing, but he was, he was talking about a, character, a particular character's motivations. It might have been, like, Woody's motivations. Um, and they had him here, and they kind of needed to get him here. And he just, there was just not a meeting in between the two. He was saying, like, that he had the rest of the writer's room. He was like, we're not leaving here until we figure out how to get. The, and it dawned on me in this moment, this guy's talking about the motivations of a puppet. You know what I mean? But it's, yeah. he's so like, um, he's so, he's looking at it from so many different angles, like looking at the mechanics of this, of the, of this, this character's function in the story. You know, it's not somebody that's just like, oh, I was just moved by the way, why, you know, no, he was, he was looking at all the combinations of things that he was going to use to, to convey this, this feeling, this thought. And at the end, you should cry but you should feel good about crying. You shouldn't, you shouldn't feel like you're, you're being cheated or like that it's cheap. You should feel like justified in it, right? And if he doesn't write that story the right way, if he doesn't choose exactly the right mechanics in that, in that narrative, you're, it's not gonna come off the same way. Uh, and so I guess 
I've, this is a huge rambling digression. No, it's coming back. I, I can feel it. <laughs> coming back to, to, to art making, um, uh, again, there is that thing that, that pulls you in. And that is the eventual goal that I think we all have. But as a practitioner, as somebody making it, if you're only looking at that surface, if that's all you see is the, uh, is the, the, the story out here and you're not looking at the, the backlog of things that, that were built up to get you to that, then you're missing, uh, um, in a way, an understanding of, of how you're going to get there, right? Yeah, that's that, I like you're how you wind up saying, I want this, to, this story to be about love and passion and it's going to look kitsch, right? Because yeah, I, I like how you're looking at it in terms of, I, I particularly like the word mechanics and, mm -hmm. and I think it, it relates back to the, to the magician analogy. Like what are the mechanics that make this magic trick work? Don't be yep. captured by the magic. And I do think you do a, a very good job. Uh, I don't want to say the word exposing, but exposing the mechanics uh, that we can see uh, in, the, in the old masters, um, in the diagrams that you put on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I think you, you have a brilliant way of, of showing, you know, beyond the fact that this is a cool face of a cool figure, here's what this color looks like when you isolate it. When you take this shape apart and you just isolate it from all the other shapes, that's how that shape looks like. So you're basically looking at what's underneath that illusion and, and exposing the mechanic. Here are the tools. These are the devices that are used in order for us to later see a face and and what i think you're doing with that which is it's very important uh and is not um intuitive to to people to art appreciators is the fact that you know we are conditioned we not us you know people who are just appreciators and not practitioners they would go and they would look at an abstract drawing or an abstract painting and they are immediately conditioned to talk about what the colors make them feel. Oh, this big blob of blue is striking me emotionally in such and such a way. Then he peppered this red over there and that makes me feel this and this. But yeah. when they look at a realistic painting, it's this, this lady is cutting some cheese. They don't look, what is the what color that, you, looking at, you know, what's the color <laughs> that creates the that cheese? sounds like a short answer to me. Yeah, it's, 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 it's exactly, you know, but they, they are, they just imagine that whatever is happening in an abstract painting somehow yeah. speaks more about the materials that are creating the composition when it's the figurative, the figurative painting doesn't. And then you only need to talk about the narrative. So I think what you're doing with your diagrams, when you point to a color and then you sample it and it's like, that's this red, that's this pink, that's mm -hmm. this gray. I, I suspect that uh, in people's head, they're like, oh, these are, these are tools. You know, he put that gray yeah. there. It's not... It's not just an eye, it's he yeah. actually made yeah. that decision. So uh, I think you do a really, really good job at actually touching on, on these important things. So what, what brought you to the, how did this diagram thing start? Where is it going? I think you're like the only one doing it. It's, it's very good. I'm happy to see that it's out there. <laughs> Thank you. There you know. It's, uh, I think in general, like, strangely at heart, I'm kind of a minimalist. You know, um, it probably comes from, from a lot of study of, of design. You know, um, you're always kind of uh, reducing and reducing and reducing and reducing and trying to understand. Um, and there's this phrase, the simplest possible expression of the subject that I use all the time. Uh, you know, I kind of, I don't know if it's an obsession, but, but it's definitely at the, at the core of my thinking when I'm kind of analyzing and learning from, from artwork is that I'm, I'm trying to always kind of reduce. Uh, because I feel like when we get to that that reduction, we have some little kernel, right, that actually becomes a little bit more like a universal thing. You mm -hmm. know, uh, idiosyncrasy is a difficult um, thing to kind of rely on in terms of understanding. Uh, if I if I if I just uh, look at the whimsy of one person, but if I can boil it down to this thing and recognize it in other places, I can cross reference and start to understand it. So. Uh, a lot of these diagrams really are about trying to kind of peel away um, all these other things, not unnecessary things, by the way, but just to investigate and to come down to some little kernel of truth uh, that hopefully can be then expounded upon right into into other places, into your own artwork, right? Because we're all trying to, I think, grab something in. And I, I think there's this, by the way, there's nothing wrong with this. I don't know, you hear a lot of, you know, uh, 
popular opinions that, you know, like uh, be always be original and everything has to be. I think that, you know, we are going to museums to see the things that we want to make in our own work. That's where everything that I do comes from in one way or another. I mean, I might, if I flatter myself, I've had an original thought once, but it's, <laughs> uh, you know, mostly it's, it's uh, um, uh, this combination of inspirations that I, I've kind of talked about before. So um, that eventually for me, I think becomes a very useful way to, to work with students is to, um, to not necessarily talk about my own idiosyncrasies, but to talk about things uh, that I think can empower them to then make their own conclusions, to draw in their own things, right? Um, if you walk into a, a museum, uh, you know, after studying with me and all I ever told you was, you know, you need to draw like me, I don't think the paintings will speak to you, right? Um, but if, if, if I work with a student and I'm trying to tell them these five things, these core things you can find everywhere, you know. What are these uh, core five that, things? We have when, to know. Well, now that's it. That's, that's the scoop. Gonna mean that you're going to sign up for my online work? No. Uh. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not. They're not actually. Uh, again, they're not um, things that I have any proprietary right to. Um, again, it's things like value. And uh, eventually, as a teacher, you understand it's not about uh, knowing the one secret truth. It's about being able to communicate it, right? And there are people in this world that are communicators. And for all the things I'm not. I am not bad at communicating and uh, I really take kind of pleasure in it and, and, and working with people individually and making tutorials and things. It's a place that I'm very comfortable. And uh, I think that was for me, it's a really nice synergy to understand that, that what for in my lifetime was just me needing to talk a lot. Uh, and then my feeling for, for finding these, um, these, these core kind of ideas, uh, um, yeah, it made for a very kind of, what's the word, like a smooth transition into to working this way, to teaching this way. You should definitely plug where people can study with you. This is important. So if you could, if you could yeah, say a few sure. words. Um, that. Everything that you need to know is at stephenbaumanartwork.com. If you visit that website, it has links through to samples of my tutorials. And if you're, if you really love them, then there's a, a portal through to my Patreon as well. Um, yeah, but that's just stephenbaumanartwork.com. It's all you need to know. Brilliant. Now, Stephen, I'm growing increasingly aware of your, of your time, and I, I know you're a busy person. Do you have a, can you spare us a few more minutes, or do you want to take, yeah? Okay, good, good. So I wanted to ask you, this, is, this might relate to the diagrams, but no, well, let's, let's keep that for, for later. Here's, here's a teaser. Uh, first, I, I, have a, I have a question for you. What would you like to see more in, more of in the realism scene because I feel like it's probably it's probably the case I, I can hot probably topics, Ken. yeah hot 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 topics, hot topics uh, because <laughs> you know I I assume this might not be the case but I assume since we're both kind of like swimming in this pool it's it's very yeah. easy to understand I guess or to guess what both of us might find uh, lacking in our disciplines that we're not a part of because by definition we're not a part of it because it speaks less to us but mm. in the kind of in the kind of uh, area that we've, we've chosen to be a part of, yeah. what, where, where do you hope that this scene would be in like 15 years? I hope it still exists. Mm. Not, not a bad uh, start. No, I mean, there's this, um, all right, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not a conspiracy theorist and this is not gonna be the beginning of a conspiracy theory. Uh, but... I, I'm only gonna say that like, um, there is this feeling of like permanence about about things that we don't investigate uh you know realism for a moment was gone in the west uh you know you you go far enough east you go to uh, uh you go to to russia and china I, I can't speak to china i can speak to russia at the very least but they have a much more unbroken tradition of realistic painting than we do here in the east right uh, there's a, a book called The uh, Twilight of Painting. I forget the author. Was it Gamel might have written it? I don't know. Uh, in any event, um, what it talks about is this kind of nadir of learning that basically broke the chain in between like a 19th century understanding of the concepts and techniques of, of representational painting and drawing um, and, and how they kind of resurfaced in some different form in the 70s and 80s you know, there was just this period where 
it just wasn't there in the shape that it had previously. Now, I think realism will be fine. <laughs> I think it'll be just okay and everybody will still be doing it. But it would be maybe um, naive to consider that it's not going to also change shape. You know, many representational artists that I know of, I think are very quick to dismiss digital painting and, and digital artwork, almost looking at it as this kind of, um, uh, I don't know if they even do look at it. Uh, you know, it's almost the, the other half of the argument for like fine art versus illustration, but there's like fine art illustration and then digital art is like off camera down somewhere here, right? Uh, now, I mean, I'm not saying everybody holds that opinion and I don't want to make a straw man and say that, oh, realist painters don't like digital painters. Uh, that's not exactly it, but but I do feel like it is this kind of swelling um, uh, practice that 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 is very accessible to a lot of people. And as we know, like making oil paintings is a very long endeavor. And, you know, we're kind of in this space right now that doesn't have a lot of patience. And digital painters, I think, can can service that lack of patience. Whereas oil painters, if we service that lack of patience, we diminish the quality of what we're making, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, sure, there's alla prima painters, and I, I know that we can do that. But, um, you know, if you look at great historical works, like Solomon J. Solomon, you know, any of his paintings, by the way, just look at any single one of them. Uh, they're not alla prima. Uh, if you look at, uh, um, you know, Nah, I'm pretty sure. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> um, uh, they're very direct, but, uh, but this, uh, this fast, snappy approach that, that's so suitable to uh, kind of um, uh, uh, growing up as an artist nowadays, uh, it's, it's not conducive to the making, I think, of the kind of artworks that I think inspired me when I was kind of starting out to get kind of interested in this. So I, I start by hoping that, that it still exists and that it doesn't kind of uh, that the world doesn't outgrow the rate at which it's necessary to create this stuff because if anything for artists nowadays and this is you know this is me like maybe this is i want to make a hot take so this is this is what i want to say Please, I that's wanna hot see, take click I see, all that stuff <laughs> i want to see less frankly you know i i think there's this need to to have everything out there and the commerce of the gallery scene, uh, uh, you know, demands that you make, you know, 15 paintings at a time. Uh, I personally don't work that way. I've made, you know, probably in my lifetime, I've, I've made like 10 paintings that I really care about. Um, but I've made hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of paintings. Um, so I, I know that these things, in my opinion, this is all opinion, this is editorial. In my opinion, it's not like buses, they don't come along 10 times a day, you know, like there's very few artworks out there that I think really reach this level of like, wow, it's amazing. And we need to make the other hundred to make sure the one works, right? Uh, so I'm not saying don't, don't make stuff, but visual culture now, nowadays is, is a very crowded place. And um, uh, I find myself sometimes just needing to, um, which is ironic because, you know, I'm, I'm so consumed in visual media. Um, to need to like shut it off a bit, you know, because I th start thinking, well, I need to make all these, these artworks, you know, I need to like everyone that has to be amazing as well. It doesn't really work like that. You know, I mean, I, I, I would love to just, you know, draw in the dark, so to speak for, for a year. Um, and, uh, and then, and then like focus on the artwork that came out of that. Is that a hot take? Is that too hot? Uh, that, I, I mean, maybe it's I, tepid. I, maybe it's a tepid that, take. Yeah, I was I was bracing myself, but it it, <laughs> it sounds very optimistic and and empowering. I was uh, how to put it. I don't want to make it seem like there's something about the realist tradition that is insufficient, right? But mm. I'm I'm trying to come at it from a positive place. Like for example, how who should? Oh, here's a here's a positive way to to say it. Who is some painter that all realist practitioners need to be more familiar with and try to find more wisdom in their work? If you could, oh, wow. if you could channel the realism stream in a direction where you think that's where art should really go, like that's what I would love to see more of. Name a few names. Do we have that? 
It's interesting, Ken, and I'm uh, uh, at, at birth, I was a contrarian. <laughs> so and I think it's, it might be something you share with me as well. So I think mm -hmm. I'm probably in good company as far as that's concerned. But um, I'm very wary of like monoculture and, uh, and, and anybody kind of grasping a hold of the narrative. And not that one statement on a podcast is going to be me grasping the narrative. But I do feel like everybody has influence. If you have a voice, you have influence. People listen to it. And so it's, it's tough. To, I don't want realism to be one thing. This is, this is another problem that I have is like the where is realism going today conversation and what should realism be? I think, I think if you're asking that question, you shouldn't be answering it. Like you should not be the one in charge of the narrative if that's the binary way in which you're assessing the progress of something so organic. Hmm. You know, realism should travel with the time across mediums. Actually, you know what? There was, it was a really great thing that I remember, uh, um, uh, Jacob Collins said, uh, if you don't know him, uh, you're under a rock somewhere. But he runs <laughs> to those, to those of you who don't, he's the founder of Grand Central Atelier, a formidable classical art school in uh, New York. Yeah, so um, we were, uh, uh, whatever, it doesn't matter the context. But anyway, so he says, uh, he describes realism as an urge, right? Uh, and he was talking about like the historical kind of trajectory of realism and talking about like different eras in which, you know, as a popular artistic taste, it was diminished or, or advanced. And he was talking about some of these diminishing times. And he said that if you study the artwork from that era, you can still see little places. You can still see little moments in the artwork where, the, where, where that urge for realism, that urge towards mm -hmm. realism, like sprung up, you know, like a, like a little plant through the crack in a sidewalk. Right, uh, and and that was the way I, I think that made the most uh, the most sense to me in terms of like where should realism go? I don't know. It should probably follow where society goes. Where where not society? Maybe that's a construction, but but where the world goes. It sh mm -hmm. I only hope that it just has a place at the table in terms of of commenting on the the, the world that that's around us. You know, I mean, there's artists I love, but God forbid that everybody started working like they did. You know. Um, but there's, you know what, uh, I, would, I would love to see in, talk, in terms of like a mood board uh, for like synergistic expressions, um, more of us should have Tomer Hanuka on, on their mood board. Uh, I think that his work, I find it so captivating. Uh, now, I mean, if you look for it now, probably you see like a lot of the movie posters and things that he does and, and, and uh, that's fine. He, they, I think they're also very good, but there's a period um, a little bit earlier where uh, uh, I think a lot of his illustrations, he was more into like graphic novels and things and, um, uh, and illustrations that were less tied to a very specific concept. Like he does like a movie poster for, uh, what's the one with Jack Nicholson and The, the Shining, right? Mm. Um, like, so he does a movie poster like that and it's a Tomer Hanuka version of them, whatever. It's, they're great, but I like a little bit his earlier illustrations. Uh, I find them like they're just so enigmatic. They're full of like questions and mystery in a way that that honestly most representational work these days I, I don't I don't find really incorporates that. I don't even know if I find that in a lot of historical artworks. Maybe a lot of historical artworks just seem mysterious because I don't know the context of them. In fact, you know, uh, if you if you've read a lot of Shakespeare. Certainly, you can appreciate more the paintings about Shakespeare, but those, I guess, look very enigmatic to me because I don't, I don't know many of the stories. But listen, Tomer Hanuka, go look him up. He's he's fantastic. Yeah. He's unbelievable. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm I'm really happy. I'm really happy you brought that reference here. Here we go. So we we have a kind of hot take. All realist painters should familiarize themselves with Tomer Hanuka, and uh, and I yeah. think that's gonna that's gonna lead us to uh to where we want to go. I want to ask maybe just just for me because i'm super curious uh mm. you have these posts sometimes on instagram where you do color corrections on original like images <laughs> from the music and you yeah. do okay to those of you who haven't seen that i'm gonna i'm gonna non-hyperbolically describe what steven does here he takes the images the the actual images that you can see uh on the museum websites that are very unsatisfying in how their colors appear and magically transforms them into something that seems far more like what the painting actually is. 
Mm. How are you? How are you performing this black magic? What are you up to? <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah, well, I mean, it starts like a public with service. Get... <laughs> it start. It is a public service. <laughs> if anything, it's the public service that I provide to 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 the world at large, um, because we've been for so long misled. It actually all started uh, um, on a trip that I took to the Frick. Um, it's on uh, the Frick is on. It's like on Fifth Avenue in New York and Seventieth uh, Street. Yeah. Um, a great little museum, beautiful architecture, beautiful home, uh, and, and some, you know, very nice paintings in there, obviously. Uh, but there was this one portrait, I mean, it was kind of anonymous, one of these anonymous 19th century or early 20th century um, uh, portraits of just some, you know, some magnate or other, right? Uh, but the painting is really nice, uh, and so you're appreciating it on a technical level. And uh, it was kind of in a relatively dim lit room. So uh, and I don't even know if you can actually take pictures at the Frick, if they allow you to. Yeah, not allowed. Okay. So uh, I had probably tried to take some surreptitiously and then uh, not gotten a satisfying one. So I got to the gift shop and I, I went to get, you know, the postcard of it. And it was just this tea soaked version of the painting that bore no resemblance, um, it, by the way, barely from a value perspective did it bear a resemblance to the actual painting itself. Uh, so I just got to thinking like, how is this, how is this happening? And I mean, you know, there's a lot of phenomenon that you can talk about like varnishes yellowing and things. And I've been a painter for like, you know, over 15 years, uh, you know, I'm friends with like art restorers that have been restorers for 60 years. It's not unfamiliar to me that, that that varnish will yellow, but there's something else going on to get to this level of yellowing, especially when the painting, as it appears in the museum, does not look like that, right? So uh, I started making these color corrections and starting this kind of conversation around it uh, on Instagram. And there was some really interesting kind of, kind of takes and information that came back. Because my suspicion was that, we talked again about this like, uh, um, this twilight of painting, right? So uh, at a certain point, you know, uh, curators, art restorers, art critics, these people would actually train nominally as painters, right? Right. And if you've looked at a, at a model under a skylight and you've tried to paint the colors true to that, I don't think there's a way that in your book or your postcard or your publication that you justify this tea-soaked yellow image. You would just know it's so, it's so wrong. It's just not true. Um, so I'm thinking that uh, these, a lot of these images that I'm seeing in, in the postcards and shops, you know, it's a cyclical thing. Probably they take, you know, they have the photographer in uh, after some paintings have been cleaned and he comes and he or she documents the, the painting, takes some photographs of it. But if that photographer is not familiar with, say, like the principles that most representational painters would be, which is about fresh color, about, about a full spectrum of color in the light that you're painting so that you can even see the color in the first place. I felt like they must have been photographing it actually under, under a different kind of lighting, under a bad kind of lighting. And I, I know that this phenomenon exists certainly because you see it in some of the postcards, but also because N.C. Wyeth's famous uh, series from Treasure Island those paintings were actually photographed on long exposures from natural light when they were photographed for their like official documentation, right? So this is a painter working together with the photographer to make sure that the, the, the images actually come out the way that they're supposed to, right? Think of how many instances in which that's not gonna happen. And we all know that even though it's a giant facade to these organizations, right? People are people and things get done. They just, oh, just get him to photograph, you know, just put him in the basement. We'll chuck it up, a couple of halogens, and we've got our, maybe we put a color filter, a gel on him or something, and then we, we get our image. In addition to that, there's um, apparently, and I didn't, I didn't know this, uh, but inks as well in, in the printing process can be something that's going to play like a major role in terms of like the, um, like the archivability of, the, of, of that actual print. So when you think of like a Rembrandt book, that, and we all know there's this, this two like red bound versions of like a Rembrandt book that were printed in like the 70s, right? And there's, that's where everybody knows Rembrandt from. Like that's everybody's first Rembrandt book. And they're all like just tea soaked, like urine yellow uh, uh, reproductions. Remember, it looks nothing like what he, what he does. Um, uh, and so some of this also would have been choosing cheaper inks, right? Um, uh, potentially uh, having photographs that were of, of paintings not in a good lighting. And, and in addition to that, for sure, 
paintings will yellow because of varnish after about maybe 20, 30 years, right? Depending upon where they're kept. Uh, but all of that being said, you know, especially in the, the, the reason the varnish ar argument sticks with me a lot is because there are curatorial staffs that actually clean and remove varnish. So if you're taking a photograph of a painting, why would you take it before you cleaned it? It's, you, you wouldn't. It's You'd senseless. It it's senseless. Right. Uh, I think but that's... When you pay so much to strip the varnish and have like this old artwork, you know, cleaned, that's the time you'd photograph it when it was fresh and beautiful and perfect, right? So, so I, d I, don't, I don't know if that's all the argument for me that just like, oh, it just happened to yellow and that's the way it looks. No, it's, there's a lot of, it's a combination of factors. And it's the, the, it's the wrong that I am writing. In, it's in so society. true. I mean, I, I, think, I think that, you know, to, pe to people listening who, who haven't seen it, you have, to take a, you, you have to take a look at it before you, you judge us for, for being sticklers about this topic. But it's really, it's, it's so important. And, you know, it got me thinking about, like, for example, where's the catalog? Like, I want to get it. But I know, of course, you, you don't own the rights to the paintings. Like, I don't know what goes behind. Like, if, if there was a moment uh, at which I could buy the corrected Stephen Bauman mm. remixes of Bauman the images, corrected version, I'd yeah. get it. I, you know, I'd want it because it's, it's absolutely fantastic since I'm sometimes I'd be like researching some piece that I want to send to a student and and I, I want to talk to the student about the colors that I know very well from having seen that painting in, in real life. And then I, I see the best image available online and I say, okay, <laughs> like this, this, is not, this is not going to do it. It's, it's terrible. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering like if you, if you foresee some kind of, of future where, where that archive is going to be available uh, as That's part of your public point. service to us. <laughs> I mean, you know, I do kind of try to, um, uh, as I've started to accept my role as like um, uh, a person that kind of runs an online school, um, you do start to think not just about servicing students in the moment, but what can you do that it's also going to kind of contribute to a catalog of, of your whatever limited understanding you have, but of your understanding of the parameters of art making. Uh, so nowadays, when I when I do engage in a project like that, I am actively looking for like licensing sources and things because uh, I, I feel like there's certainly an appreciation for these things, if not like maybe a need for these things. Um, so it's all on the horizon for me. It's just about um, how many different uh, versions of me I can I can you know use to <laughs> navigate all these ideas that I have. You know, it's so hard being like a sole proprietor because you know, I have 10 ideas a day, nine of them are bad, but if you line up that one good one for the, for the year, you know, every day you have like some interesting avenue that you could explore. There's only, only so many things that you, you can do, but for sure I'm being, um, uh, I'm trying to be as smart as I can about cataloging a lot of the changes and trying to also figure out a way uh, because it is, you know, the, the waters you're trying to navigate there are kind of licensing rights and things. And sometimes you're, you're up against like an orphaned uh, image where the licensing rights are, are like, are, don't like really exist and that's fine. But then there's other times there's a little bit more nebulous than that. Like the, the National Galleries of Scotland have that, that great painting of uh, Lady Agnew of Loch Ness by, by Sargent. And uh, I've honestly, I've probably had 10 phone calls and 20 emails back and forth just trying to ex establish exactly where it sits for what I want to do to be able to actually disseminate that 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 image uh, so it's, it's really hard actually it's really hard to kind of navigate that stuff when you have a lot of other stuff to do as well yeah it sounds and sounds impossible I'll just share that in my in my dream uh, what hap what ends up happening and if if there's anything that we can do to to make that day come sooner uh, we we shouldn't hold back uh, you should just be the first one on the phone when every museum is is organizing their their actual archive. Like you, mm -hmm. you should probably. I, I'm sorry. I mean, I want you to paint, and I love your paintings, <laughs> but I also want you to fix everything that's wrong with uh, the digital representations of our fav favorite yeah. paintings. Hey, and listen. You touch on a fantastic point, Ken. Let me tell you, not about me, but when these monogram books are coming out, and we listen, we all know that that. A lot of times when those books are coming out, especially nowadays, um, I feel like there should be a painter consultant, actually, that's going through and actually assessing all the imagery in that book, looking for first consistency, um, not only for, and this is, by the way, you can get really granular with this stuff, right? Because you can't just have some modern color corrector 
color correcting a picture for which pigments and chroma levels did not exist. So you're taking a Tintoretto painting and you're pushing all the levels. There was no pigment that could possibly do that, right? So, so the color correction has to be sensitive. I, I, by the way, this is imagining that the producers of these monogram books really want to be like primo historically accurate. If they do, you need to consult painters, not only painters that have like some technical ability, but have some historical understanding of the different eras of pigment development, which is not hard to find. You get an artist manual, like pigment histories are a really clearly established thing. Uh, so, so dates of origin can be, can be understood and how that would correlate to the expression of light and color in like an inert image. So, but I say inert also because again, you know, paintings, the light in paintings exists in a very different way than certainly, I mean, obviously in what exists digitally, right? Because, you know, you have this emanating screen. To a certain extent, there's a little bit of an emanating sense in paintings if, if there's this thinness, like yeah, uh, glaze, thin glazing and such when- too, Right, that can be like a little bit of an emanating light feeling to it, um, uh, but certainly, you know, if you're reproducing that like on a book page, you have a totally different set of considerations about like what the, the color and light and value situation uh, should be. So I think there needs to be uh, a consultant. Um, or, or you could write the manual, how to correct colors for a paint. That's it. That's it. And yeah. then that manual should be on the desk of every museum website manager. And I think that will solve a lot of the problems out there in the world. Steven, thank you so much for, for uh, setting the time aside to do this with me. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you want to send people to your work once again, uh, maybe tell them how to follow you on Instagram, stuff like that. People would, people would benefit from seeing more of what you do. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, Stephen Bauman Artwork on uh, Instagram, Stephen Bauman Artwork on Patreon. And I also have a YouTube channel, which is unsurprisingly named Stephen Bauman Artwork. Um, and you can sample a lot of my tutorials. Uh, I do um, uh, kind of serialized uh, um, video content there called What We Love About, where I'm talking about different artists, a lot of these different musings that I have about, about that artist's career and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Just, uh, you know what, if you Google Steve Mountain Artwork, you're going to find everything. So, so just do that. Brilliant, Stephen. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ken. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to see it grow, please take a moment to subscribe, rate it highly, and share it with a friend. If you'd like to become a supporter of the show and have access to exclusive content, please consider signing up as a patron at patreon.com slash Ken Goshen. For online lessons, please visit kengoshen.com slash lessons. Thanks again, and see you next time.